document that you're looking at right now, all of this is on Blackboard. In the last class, we talked about, or I mentioned the batteries, and we talked about batteries in series. And you know there's two ways to connect them up. You can connect them up in what we call series aiding connection, or we can connect them up in a series opposing connection. But I bet you didn't know, if you look at this topic sheet, I bet you didn't realize all this other stuff that you can find out about batteries. So right now, you're looking at the uh, number to text me for your attendance. If you haven't already done that, go ahead and send me a text. Put your name, first and last in there. Make sure you write EET131, and go ahead and send that to me now. And I'm going to clear the board in about five seconds, and then we'll jump right into the material. So we got a lot to talk about, and this is actually uh, this is new stuff. Uh, I think uh, what three semesters ago I added this to uh, the course, this section on batteries. Uh, we used to just talk about number one, the difference between the battery and the cell, and we talked about series aiding and series opposing uh, sources. But there's so much more of the batteries that since you guys are majors, you're engineering electrical majors. I think that uh, the time that we spent uh, delving into this will be kind of kind of well spent. I think you'll appreciate it. So we already talked about the difference between a series aiding and series uh, opposing connection of batteries. But I don't know if I ever told you the difference between the battery and the cell. And also, if you missed that last lecture, the one on Friday, where we talked about series aiding and series opposing connections, uh, Go back and make sure you watch the video. I don't know if I have your video posted, but by, by the end of the day today, I'll have all that updated and posted. So make sure you go back and watch that. Let's talk about the difference between the battery and the cell. And again, I might already mention this, but if I didn't, or if I did, I'll just do it twice. So in the past, I showed you three ways of representing a voltage source or voltage. We can Show it like that. Let me show it like this. Let me show it like this. And on here, the long line represents the positive polarity, the short, negative, same on here, positive, negative. In this circle, you just put the plus and minus in there like that. So these are all voltage sources. And what I said was on the like the second week, third week of class. I said, you can use all these interchangeably. I don't care. Up until at least today, they're all the same. But in reality, these two are different. The one on the left is called a battery. And the one on the right is called a cell. And this one can represent either one. Now, the word battery means group. Group. You can have a battery of men if you go into war. If you have a battery of men, it's a group of men. Well, when you see battery, they mean a battery of cells. So a cell, a cell is the smallest. If you think about what voltage is, voltage is a separation of charge. The smallest thing that can separate charge is a cell. If you take more than one cell and put them together, you have a group, a group of cells. You have a battery of cells. They just drop the word and call it the battery. So all the battery is is a group of cells. Matter of fact, if you look at the way the cell symbol is drawn, this looks like I covered it up. That's a cell. They're showing you is just cells put together. So a battery is a group of cell cells, and a cell is the smallest voltage-producing unit you can have. And what I mean by that is, you now know what voltage is. Voltage is anything that separates charge. So if I have one thing that separates charge, then that thing is a cell. A poor, put more than one cell together, and that thing is a battery, a battery of cell or a battery for sure. So when you go to the store and you buy for your, uh, I don't know, for your remote, for your Sony, uh, what is that, PlayStation, when you buy that battery, a double-A battery, it's really not a double-A battery, that's a cell. That's a double-A cell. Now, if you put more than one together in your remote, you can call it a battery of cells or just a battery. But that really is a cell. 
As a matter of fact, let's think about that. The thing that you used to call a battery, but now you know it's a cell, you got the double way, you got a C, C, C battery is really a C cell. So it's a C, you got the D, I think you got a triple A. Does anybody know the voltage of a uh, double A battery? What's the voltage range? How many volts is it? 1.5. It was 1.5. Does anybody know the voltage rating of a triple A battery? How much the how much is the voltage of a triple A? I'll tell you, it's 1.5. What about a C battery? A C see I said it wrong. A C cell. How many volts is that? 1.5. 1.5. What about the D cell? The D is a what? 1.5. So they have all of these cells that have the same voltage. What's the difference between one and the other, of the physical difference? Size. Size. The D cell is really fat compared to the C, compared to the A, the triple A, and so forth. But they're all the same voltage. So what do you think the difference is? What what can the what can what can the D cell do that the, that the triple A can't do? What happens as I move from left to right and they get bigger? Does it provide the yes. voltage for a longer time? Say it again. It provides a voltage source for a longer amount of time. Okay, that could be true. And if that's true, then this is what we're talking about. And I'll explain what this is in a minute. But there's something more important than that, though. Well, I shouldn't say it's more important, but something that should be more evident than that. What does a battery deliver? Well, it delivers power, but how does it deliver power? What's actually moving? Current. Current. So this thing called current capacity. So the way you have a D cell, C cell, double A, triple A, you have all these batteries, exactly the same voltage, but the size battery you need is going to be dictated by the current draw. How much current does this device that you're going to design or, or you're going to power, how much current does it need? The D cell has a higher current capacity than the C, which is higher than the A, which is higher than the AAA, and so forth. So we'll talk about that maximum current capacity in just a second. But my point I was making is that these are cells. Well, you say, all right, Singleton, well, you said that if it's one thing together, then it's a cell. If I got a group of them, it's a battery. Then why do they call a car battery a battery? They don't call it a car cell. They call it a car battery. And you'd have a good point. But if you take a look at a car battery, here's now the new car batteries, you can't see this. But uh, who's out there? Uh, let me see. You guys are Similac babies. I think probably the oldest person. John, you might be the oldest part. John, you remember when they had car batteries and they have a terminal, they have a positive terminal here and they have a negative terminal here, but then they have these little caps. You ever seen a battery like that? They have yes. little caps. Yes. And you can take those caps off. If you look down in there, you see lead plates and a liquid, which it was acid and some other chemicals in there that yeah. I don't know about. But each one of those caps, there were six of them. There were six, basically there are six chambers in here. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. And each one of those chambers had a cap on it. And guess what each chamber is? Each chamber is a cell, and each cell produces two volts. So this cell produces two volts. This cell produces two volts. This cell, two two volts, two volts, all six cells produce two volts. If you take two times six, you get what? Twelve. You get the 12 volts that you know your, your car battery is rated at. Car batteries are rated at 12 volts because they have six two volt cells built in. It's just in one case, one packet, so it looks like one thing, but actually a car battery is a group of six cells. And back in the old days, when you have a bad battery, they would say, hey, I got a bad cell in my battery. What they meant was one of these plates in there, something in there was wrong with that. So this is the correct terminology isn't called a battery because it's a group of cells. It's just in one case. So 
The first thing you want to know is the difference between a battery and a cell. A cell is the smallest voltage producing unit you can have. You know anything that separates voltage, anything that separates charge is a voltage. So anything, any single thing that does that is a cell. And I put a group of cells together, I got a battery. So know the difference between a battery and a cell. And then here, guys, when you're doing schematics for me, when you're drawing your diagrams, I don't care which one of the three you use. But when you get graduated and you go to P&G or wherever you go to get your job, sometimes you have to take like a little test to see if you really know what you're talking about. And at that point, when you're out, you want to make sure that you let people know you know the difference between a battery, a battery and a cell. But among friends, we can call them the same thing. Does anybody have any questions over the difference between a battery and a cell? Questions or comments? Okay. So, oh, before I forget, uh, I keep looking at the screen. I need to look at you guys. Before I forget, we are going to meet tomorrow. God forbid that it doesn't snow again or the temperature doesn't drop down below zero. My, the intentions are that we'll meet tomorrow. Uh, I think I got, I got a, if you're, I don't know your, your section number. Leave again, 001, we go 8 to 10, and 002 is 10 to 12. But we are going to meet for lab. You will need to bring your digital multimeter. You'll need to bring your lab and uh, whatever work we were going to bring in last Tuesday before I cancel. The homeworks, you want to you want to bring that stuff in, anything that needs to be graded. Also, uh, I did post homework two. It's on Blackboard in the homework folder. Homework two covers chapters uh uh, I believe it covers chapter series in parallel. You got you got to look at it. You're not. I don't have a due date on it because we don't. You're not going to be. Able, you can do some of the problems already, but some of it you won't be able to do because we haven't talked about the information yet. So I put to be announced for the due date. But guys, if you get bored, go ahead and download the homework and start working on it. If you run into a problem that you, we haven't talked about yet, just wait. Once we're done with this stuff, we'll move on to. Um, Parallel circuits, and you should be able to work the homework. I just want, want to let you know it was there. It's up there. Okay, now this concept, this next one, the ideal source and the practical source, is really a topic that comes later on in electronics. When you take uh, your solid state electronics, or they call it, I think they, here they just call it electronics, they talk about this, or they're supposed to talk about it, they teach it the right way. I don't teach that class, so I don't know if they do, but my problem is not everybody takes that class because I got some of you guys are, uh, I think if you're EET or biomedical, then you'll talk about, you'll learn about this. But if you're electromechanical or, uh, forget the other one, power systems, I don't think you take electron, you may not get, so I added this to the course. So it's a little, little advanced, but I think you guys can understand it. So I want to talk about that if nobody has a question over number one. So, so far, and in most books, they deal with ideal devices. And what I mean by ideal, you tell me, when I say ideal, what do you think of? What does that mean to you? If something is ideal, it's what? Perfect or? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and that word perfect, if you think about the word perfect, it has two meanings, like uh, in the Garden of, in the garden of uh, uh, Eden, Adam and Eve, they were perfect. They didn't make mistakes. But perfect also means, in an engineering point of view, perfect in the sense that it does what it's designed to do. It does it exactly the way it's supposed to. And I always say perfection is if God can make a battery, if God can make a result, this is how it will behave. How does it behave? And so what we do in engineering is we, we, we talk about ideal devices and we present ideal devices all the time realizing that when we actually create a device, it'll never act like the ideal device. So what we do is strive to make devices better and better, better and better, realizing that we never get to the perfect of the ideal. But let me show you what I'm talking about. So here is a here's an ideal voltage source. I can draw that or I can draw the cell. And let's just say it's uh, 10 volts. Now, in electrical engineering, there's something called the response. The response. You'll hear that word a lot. The response is 
response. Response is C. Is it a C? I can't remember how to spell response, but I think it's an S. Oh, my cousin's over here. He's saying it's an S. <laughs> I don't feel. I don't feel. I don't feel bad at all because the guys that can spell when I was in college, they can't differentiate a, a differential equation. So I felt all right about that. But it's an S. Thank you. Uh, who was that that corrected me? Mike. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so response. So, but here, here's an important thing. The word response means how does it behave over time? So if I make a graph, you know what it looks like. If I make a graph, say I make a graph, I think that might be too light for you to see. I hate for all my colors to be black, but these markers are, okay. If I make a graph, say this is a graph of, voltage and current. So over time, so if I go this way, I'm pulling more voltage. And I mean, now, now this is the this is the this is the independent variable, and this is the dependent variable. The way I have this drawn. So what I'm what this graph is trying to say is, as I pull more current, let's look at what happens to the voltage. And for this voltage source, here's what I have to draw. Now what is that graph? What is it saying? When you look at that, what what is it what is it saying? That the voltage is constant uh, upon the draw of the current. Yeah, the voltage is constant no matter how much no matter how much um, current you draw from. And I think about what I just said. The voltage is constant no matter how much current you draw from. Now, really, what's happening is we get we're, we're drawing. Even though you're thinking about voltage and current moving, what's really happening is you're getting those joules per second, which is power, and power is just energy per unit time. So, really, what you're saying is that this thing right here, this goes all the way to infinity. You're saying that this thing right here can deliver an infinite amount of power. The voltage should stay the same no matter how much current you pull from it. It's saying that that battery can provide an infinite amount of power. We know that's not right. Let me show you why it's not right. The reason it's not right is everything in the world has resistance. Everything in the world has resistance, even this thing right here. Now, when I say it has resistance, here's what I don't mean. I don't mean if you take a battery or cell and you open it up, you'll see one of these in it. You will not see a resistor inside of, inside of it. But you will see uh, maybe if it's a car battery, you'll see lead plates. You'll see acid. You'll see uh, chemicals. I don't. I don't know what they are. You'll see stuff in the battery. And if you take your digital multimeter and you put it on ohms and you stick it in the battery, the stuff in the battery actually has an ohmic value. It has a resistance. It's not a resistor, but it has resistance. You can do exactly the same thing with your with your body, right? You can. You can. Right now, you can get your digital multimeter. You can put it on ohms and you can you can grab the leads like this. And you can look at your meter and you can measure, you get the measurement, you get the measurement of what? You get the measurement of your body resistance from this point to this point. You're, you're getting a resistance, but you know if you open up your chest, there's not, there's not a resistor in there. It's a resistance of all the stuff between these two points. So when you take a battery or any kind of device and you measure the resistance, the inside resistance of it, it's called the internal resistance or source resistance. So everything has a source resistance. And that source resistance acts just like a resistor in that it dissipates heat. So an ideal battery is like this. If I draw an ideal battery of all this source, it's like this. Oops, that's not what I want to show you. The ideal is like this. The practical or actual source is like this. So I have a little resistor there. And then what they'll do is they'll put like a dotted line around this. And that resistor right there, they, sometimes they'll call it R source or R internal. And you got to understand what that means. 
It doesn't mean there's a resistor inside the battery. There is not. It does mean that the stuff they use to make the battery, the lead, the chemical, all the stuff they make, all of that stuff has resistance. And whatever the resistance is, they represent it with this. They call it the internal resistance or source resistance. And the reason they put the box around it is so that you know that this is one piece. It's not like I, I, I added a resistor series with the battery. That's not what that means. That means that this is the resistance of that thing. So a ideal voltage source, we never show the resistance. A practical voltage source, you, you, you got to show the resistance. And here's why it's important. I'm going to take both of these and put them up in the circuit. Let's say I take a ideal voltage source, 10 volts. I hook it to a resistor, 10 ohms. And I want you to do two things. I want to know the voltage across the resistor, this one, the one I got connected up. And I want to know the current to the resistor, this one. Who can tell me how much current is flowing to that resistor, the 10 ohm? How much current is flowing? Is it one? One amp, right? One amp, yeah. How do we get that? Well, he said, well, I got 10 volts. I got 10 ohms. Current equals voltage over resistance. I got 10 volts over 10 ohms. I have one amp of current flowing in the circuit. So I got one amp flowing. And since this resistor right here gets one amp, if I take that one amp times that 10 volts, or I said it, if I take that one amp times that 10 ohms, I'm going to get 10 volts. So if you take your meter and measure across there, you should, you should see 10 volts. And from the circuit, you can see that. If I put my meter here, I measure 10 volts. Or bring it over here, I measure 10 volts. So in the perfect world, that's how that would behave. But that's not what really happens. It's not what really happens because here's, here's what you really have. You really have a battery, but the battery itself has an internal resistance, a source resistance. And it's usually quite small. I don't, I don't know what it is. We'll just say for the sake of, of an example, let's just say the resistance of all the stuff that the battery is made of, let's say it's one ohm. So the way you indicate that, that you're using not an ideal source, you're using a practical source, is you draw the voltage source, which you put this little resistor in series with it, and you call this RS for R source, or R-I-N-T for R internal. And then we know that this is 10 volts. We said we're going to let this be one ohm. So I'm going to do the same exact thing I did before. Now remember, you told me before, the current in the circuit is 10 volts or 10 amps. And you also told me the voltage across the resistor was 10 volts. That's what you told me in the ideal, with the ideal voltage source. If we hook it up, the actual voltage source up to 10 ohms, Who can tell me what the current in the circuit is now? How much current is flowing now? Well, I forgot my dots. I got to put this box around it to show that that's not a separate resistor. That's not even a resistor at all. It's the resistance of the stuff that makes up the battery, the internal resistance. So who can tell me now how much current is flowing in that circuit? Would you subtract the uh, the ohms from the volts? Nope. We we we're, we're doing. You wouldn't subtract the ohms. You would you would do the other thing, right? If I want to solve a series circuit, what's the first thing I got to do? Very first thing I got to do is find the total resistance. The second thing I do is I got to find the total current using that resistance. And the third thing I do is I can find any voltage drops using I times R from above, IT times R, 
right? So what's the total resistance in this circuit? 11. It's 11. Why is it 11? Hold on, it's 11. We only hooked up a 10 ohm resistor. We did, but that 10 ohm resistor, when you hook it up to the battery, which has its own internal resistance of one ohm, the total resistance of the circuit is really 11. So instead of getting 10 amps in the circuit, here's what you really do. The current is going to be the voltage or the resistance, but the problem is the resistance is not just this like you thought when you had an ideal device. It's really this plus this. It's really R source plus, we just call that R. So I got to put in 11 here. And over here, I got to put in 10. So if you take 10 volts divided by 11 ohms, how much did you get? So you have 0 0.90, 0 0.91. I get, zero, I get 0 0.9. 0 0.9. So I got 0.9 amps before you said it was 10 amps. Why? Because we had an ideal voltage source in there. You can't go buy an ideal voltage source from radio. Well, Radio Shack doesn't exist anymore. But you can't go to the battery store and buy an ideal battery. Every battery is going to have an internal resistance. And so every battery is going to give you a little less voltage than what you want. So whereas before we said, all right, we have 10 amps in the ideal circuit. In the actual circuit, we only have 0.9 amps, which means if I take 0.9 times this 10 right here, that means I'm going to get 9 volts across the resistor when I want it, 10 volts. You see how the ideal source kind of fools you into thinking something that's not real? The, the, the practical source is a more accurate representation of what's going on. But that, that's not even the important thing yet. The important thing is this. What happens if, uh, what happens if I make this resistor smaller? If I make the resistor smaller, well, let me say it another way. What happens if I draw more current from the battery? If I draw more and more and more current. Now think about this. Think about this. If I want to calculate the voltage drop across that resistor right there, that voltage drop, we'll call it Vs. That voltage drop is dropped inside the battery before it ever comes out. I know voltage doesn't move, but all this is done internal to the battery. And so the voltage dropped across that internal source resistance is going to equal to the current draw from the battery times the value of the source resistance, right? And so we said the source resistance has a value of 1 ohm. So let's put that in there, 1 ohm. Now, what happens as this current goes up? Now, the way, the way that current's going to go up is by putting a smaller resistor here. The smaller I make, because you can see that current equals voltage divided by resistance, but the resistance here is going to be RS plus R. It's going to be this resistance plus that resistance. So I can call this RT. That's my total resistance. RS plus R is my total resistance, right? I can erase that and just call it RT. So if I make this smaller, I keep this the same, I keep the voltage the same, but I make the resistance smaller by making this smaller, and that current is going to go up. Well, when you do that, the thing you hook up to the battery is called the load. So if I decrease the load, the current's going to, going to go up. And here's where the problem happens. If you look at this relationship right here, the source voltage of the voltage drop across the source resistance is equal to the current through the resistance times the drive of resistance, if that current goes up, what happens to this voltage drop right here? Will it increase, decrease, or stay the same? So would, it, would it increase? It's going to increase. It's going to increase. And if this increases, if that increases, that means you're going to lose more voltage across this resistor before it ever gets out to the terminal. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, because so it's drawing. Let's, let's do another calculation, and you'll see what I'm saying. Let's make this, let's turn this resistor all the way down to 1 ohm. Now, remember, we want 10 volts out here. In a perfect world, we want 10 volts. What if I made this 1 ohm? 
If I made it one on, how much current is going in the circuit now? Five amps. Okay, so, so I got current is voltage over resistance. I got a voltage, 10 volts. I got a current, I mean resistance of two ohms. I get five amps. If I got five amps going through this resistor, five times one is what? Five, five volts, which means this one's only getting what? Five. I've lost five volts inside the battery before anything ever comes out of it. Because the more current you draw through a, a, a source resistance, the more voltage is lost inside the battery. You see why this is important? I mean, it's not important if, if, you're, if, you're, if your current draw is real small. The, the, the key thing to understand is this. Is the voltage lost, and I'm going to call this the voltage loss. The voltage loss. Voltage loss. And what I mean is the voltage that never makes it outside the battery is dependent on how much current you draw. The more current you draw, the less voltage you're going to get out to what you want to power. Because you're losing voltage across the source resistance of the thing that you use to power the device. So if, if the current is small, then it's not an issue. Most of the time, we use a battery, the current is small. But if you ever have a battery in some kind of application where you, where you pull a lot of current, you will never get, if, if, let's say you use a car battery rated at 12 volts, but you're pulling a lot of current from it, you'll never get 12 volts out of it. You might get nine, you might get seven, you might get six, because you're losing voltage across the resistance of the stuff that the battery's made out of. And so that's called an a practical voltage source. So what you do is you try to limit how large, how, how small you make the load. If you limit how small you make the load, then but then you limit the current draw, and if you limit the current draw, then you have a little bit more control over uh, how much voltage you lose in, inside the battery. Uh, again, that topic's a little bit advanced, but I hope you can kind of see get a basic understanding of what I mean. I didn't do a lot of math here, because when you get to electronics, for those of you who have taken, there's a way we treat this. There's an equation. What happens, what, what happens is there's a, there's a minimum low resistance that we won't go below that'll, that'll keep this at a level that's acceptable. I mean, you're always going to lose some voltage. Anytime you draw current from a, from a, uh, a battery, you're going to lose some voltage internal to the device. If you ever wonder, and you guys will see this, you take a car volt, people ask me this all the time. You get a car volt battery, it's supposed to be 12 volts, but when you measure the voltage, it's not 12. It's 12.7, it's 12.5, it's just always above 12. One reason that is, is because we want this to be a little higher so that when you start drawing current from the device, it, it drops down closer to 12, because whoever, whoever designed the car battery realizes that you're always going to lose some voltage across the source resistance. So on purpose, they designed the voltage to be a little higher than what is rated at. Anybody have any questions over this? There's some calculations that go along with this, but I'm not including that in this class. I just want you to know the difference between a practical voltage source and an ideal voltage source and why it's important to understand why a a practical voltage source, why it's understand, you, you want to understand, I, I guess I want to say how it behaves, not so much why, but how it behaves. The more current I draw from it, the less terminal volts I'm going to get. And the reason is I'm losing voltage internal to the battery because I'm pulling more current through the source resistance. Ooh, that was a lot. Anybody want to ask me any questions over that? Seems like it'd be important for any of the electrical engineering. Uh, right. And, yeah, and he's right. And see, guys, what happened, I shouldn't go off on this tangent. If it were up to me, you guys have to take all these classes. But back about, I want to say like five years ago, the state of Ohio limited the number of credits that each program for all the state colleges and universities, they limited the number of programs you can have for an associate's degree. So we had to do, and I was part of the, the, the committee that did that. We had to start taking courses out. And I didn't like that because, uh, you know, you want to take as much of this stuff as you can. So, yeah, I agree. Whoever made that comment, this is important. But they said, like, everybody had to take, like, 60 hours and be graduated. So some of the some of the associate programs had 75 hours of them. 
you know, and uh, but we had to cover the material. But they wanted everybody to graduate within two years, and I, I did. I think that was a mistake. It's not a Cincinnati State thing; it's a state of Ohio thing. But I agree with you. This is important. Anybody have any questions or comments over practical and ideal boulder sources? Again, we didn't do any calculations. That, that's not my point. I just wanted to mention it. And hopefully, you can understand kind of what I'm saying. If not, it may be better when you guys come to the lab and we can I can show you uh, more face to face. But just in general, anybody have any questions for me over this? No, sir. I'm all good. Okay. Well, let's go to this one. This is the one we're going to spend our most time, the battery ratings. And this is the one, remember I told you there's an assignment called the battery assignment. It's going to count as a quiz grade. You need to follow what I'm doing here in order to be able to do that assignment. So everybody pretty much knows about the first one. Everybody knows a battery has a voltage range. You know that if you have a D cell, a triple A cell, double, most people know those cells are rated at 1.5 volts. Most people know that car batteries are rated at 12 volts. So most people have seen the term voltage and they understand that batteries have a certain voltage rating. So I'm not gonna spend any time talking about that. The voltage rating is usually stamped on the battery somewhere. It's stamped on the battery. Well, not many people or fewer people to understand about current rating, the max current capacity, max current capacity. And I already showed you the difference between a D cell, a C cell, a double A, triple A. The bigger, in general, the bigger the battery, the more the more power the battery can deliver. But for a specific class of batteries, but in general, what we really want to say is the bigger the battery, the more current it can deliver. So every battery has a maximum current capacity. If you go above that, the battery can't supply enough current to fulfill the needs. Okay, so I just call that I max. Maximum current capacity. Now that's usually not printed on the battery. Um, to find that number, usually, it would be some engineering thing. So the, the a common layperson wouldn't need to know that. Uh, if, you're do, if you're designing something, you want to know, okay, what battery should I choose for this particular application? Then you would go to the manufacturer. You would ask for some. You would ask for something called a spec sheet, and would have this other information on it. So voltage rating, not too much to say about it. Max current rating. As a rule of thumb, the bigger the battery, the more current the battery can provide for a given voltage. Now, this is important right here, the amp hour is very important. Sometimes you'll see amp hour printed on the battery. Sometimes you will see it, sometimes you won't. I have seen it on batteries. And, uh, so let me show you, amp hour is a number that the manufacturer comes up with. But here's why it's important. Battery has something called the life. And the life of a battery is how long will that battery maintain a charge? How long will it maintain a charge? How long, how long can that battery provide current at a certain rate? It's called the life. And the way you get that is you take the amp hour rating, and I usually abbreviate it like this, amp hours, and divided by the number. Now, we, we use I for current, but for this formula, they just use A for amps. So this is the amp hour rating over amps, that would be the amp hour rating. This will be the current drawn in your circuit, drawn. So you can see why they do it this way, because it looks like the A's cancel out like that, and it looks like my answer's in hours, which is what you want. So it might be something like this. Let's say you get a battery that has a a rating of 100 amp hours. And let's say I'm going to I'm going to draw uh, I don't know. Let's say I'm going to draw two amps of current from it, two amps. In theory, I should be able to use that battery for 50 hours. 
And you can see where that would be useful to know. If I want to have something, some kind of remote control device, it's going to be powered by battery. I want to know how long is it going to last. Well, with this equation, you can, you can tell. If you know the amp hour rating, and every battery has an amp hour rating. Either it's stamped on the battery or it's on the spec sheet. And from that, if you know the amp hour rating, and you know how much current you're going to draw from the battery, you can tell how long that battery is going to last. Now, I did say that this is a theoretical equation. I want to tell you what I mean by that in just a second. Before I do that, does anybody have any questions for me? Uh, I will write this equation down and understand what it means. Does anybody have any questions for me over what I mean by amp hours? There was a, uh, I don't know, maybe about five, four or five years ago, I was at one of my rental properties, and I was standing on the front porch, and I was looking across the street, and this guy comes out, and he has a, a, a iPad thing, and uh, he puts something on the ground, and he pushed the button, and this drone just takes off and shoots up like breeze light. And I was like, well, that's the first real drone. I've seen drones on TV. He had a real drone. I'm like, wow, that thing was, I couldn't even see it anymore. So I went over to him and I was like, man, well, what are you doing? He had a drone, drone called a Phantom. And he showed me his iPad or whatever that thing was. He was flying this thing. And he showed, and he, the, the, the uh, drone had a camera on it. And I said, well, how much did you pay for that? He paid $1,000 for the drone, the Phantom whatever. It was $1,000 back when he bought it. And he showed me these aerial pictures. He said, well, I'm at 1,000 feet now by the F FAA or whoever. You're not supposed to go over 400 feet, he said. But he was at 1,000. And I'm thinking, well, I want one of those. And it was pretty cool. And then he, 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 this thing would follow him. He brought it down. And when he brought it down, it had, like, all these battery packs on it. And I was thinking, that, that costs $1,000. You better know if it's 1,000 feet up. You better know how long it will stay up there. You don't want the battery to run out and it comes crashing down. Well, how can the designer know approximately how long will this thing stay aloft? They got to know the amp-hour rating of the, the powering system, the battery or group of batteries that's powering the drone. So this is a really important thing to know. So I said this was a theoretical equation. I want to show you why I said that. Let me share something with you. First, I want to share a picture with you. Of some old batteries. Look at this picture. I like this picture. This came out of my book when I was in school back in 19. <coughs> Excuse me. That was a convenient cough. <laughs> it really was. I like it because, uh, well, number one, look right here. What do you notice about this battery? This is what. We call this a transistor battery. What do you notice about it other than the square? It's 9 volts, but what's the amp hour rating of it? Milli. Yeah, see that? Amps. It's, it's milliamp hours. It's 300, what is that, 392 milliamp hours at what? At? Milliamps. 8 milliamps. So they always have a test current. Now, I'll, I'll talk about that test current in a second. Well, here is your, uh, I don't know if this is a D cell or, or C cell. Again, it's 1.5 volts, but look at this. Look at this. It's 100 milliamp hours, right? Uh, look at, I don't know what this is. Here's your car battery. This is a, now, now you can see why I like to use this. Remember I said that a car battery is really, here are the caps I was talking about. There's one, two, three, four, five, six caps. And each one of these chambers right here is a cell. Here's a cell. And each cell produces ideally two volts. And you got six of them. So from this terminal to this terminal, you got you got six, you got six series cells that produce 12 volts. But that's not why this picture's here. The picture's here. This is called a Delco DC-12. That's an old car battery. Well, look at its amp hour rating. Look at this down here. 70 amp hours at what? 3.5. 3.5 amps is the test current. So if you're pulling, if you're pulling 
3.5 amps or less, then you can expect the amp hour rating to be 70 amp hours. Now, let me explain to you why I said that this equation on the board is a theoretical equation, and you need to know what I'm about to say for the exam, exam one. Or maybe it's exam two. Yeah, for exam two. Let me show you two more physical quantities that the amp hour rating depends on. So look at this graph. See it? There's the equation we talked about right here. That's the theoretical equation. In the perfect world, if God made batteries, this is how it would behave. But what does this graph right here show you? The amp hour rating depends on what? Temperature. Temperature. And amp hour rating also depends on this discharge rate is how much current are you pulling from the battery. So write that down. Amp hour rating is temperature dependent, and amp hour rating depends on the current you're drawing from the battery. Let's look at each one of those independently. So, for example, let's do the one, uh, let's do this one first. Let's do discharge rate. So somebody look at the graph. Now notice right here, they did not start the graph at zero. They started at what? You see they started at 3.5? Yeah. Now, the reason they started at 3.5 is th these are the graphs for that Delco DC-12, that car battery that I just showed you, and it had a test current of 3.5. And so what this graph is saying is for that Delco DC-12, is if, you're, if your test current is 3.5 amps or less, if you're pulling 3.5 amps or less from that battery, then your amp hour rating will be 70. And you can put that in this equation and do the calculation you want to do. But let's say you're pulling more than 3.5 amps from the battery. Let's say instead of 3.5, let's say you're pulling 25 amps from the battery. If you put if you pull 25 amps from the battery, what's your new amp hour rating? If I pull 25 amps, I'm right here. So 12. So I go up the line right here, right? Here's the curve. I go up here, and I go over, where am I? Is it 2.8? I'm right here. You see it? Can you guys see the pictures I'm drawing? Can you see these or not? Yeah. You see, if I'm at 25 amps, I go up 3.5, 10 amps, 15, 20. If I'm at 25 amps, then my new amp hour rating is about what? What is that number about right here? 54. Oh, 50, yeah, 55. 55, right? So instead of using 70 in this equation, I would have to use 55. I can't use the 70 if I know that my thing I'm going to power is full of 25 amps. I can't use 70 here. I'm going to use 55, which means the light is going to decrease because I've decreased the top number. That means it's not going to last as long, and that should make sense to you. So what? how would you describe this? This graph. If I increase the current draw, what happens? What happens to the amp hour rating? The more current I draw, the what? The less amp hour rating. Yeah. The less my amp hour rating. So that's the takeaway. The more current I draw, the less my amp hour rating. So anytime you go above the test current for that battery, then you're going to lose some amp hour rating, which means you're going to shorten the life of the battery. Okay, so. That's the graph on the right. Now, let's look at the graph on the left. Now, this was interesting because you can see that empire rating varies with temperature. Again, this is for the Delco DC-12. But as over here, they had empire rating, empire capacity. Over here, they had something called percent capacity. So what is percent capacity? Well, what that means is, well, let me show you what it means. Here's what it means. Again, for the Delco DC-12, it tells you right here that this graph is for the Delco DC-12, which had an amp hour rating of 7. 
So what they're saying is, is that if you're operating at Delco, Delco DC 12 at 80 degrees, then what's your, what's your percent capacity? If you're at 80 degrees, what's your percent capacity? 100. 100. You do this. You go up the graph, 80 degrees, intersect the curve, and come over, we'll be 100. 100% 100 of what? 100% of the 70. Does that make sense? The, the battery was rated at 70 amp hours and at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're at 80 degrees, you can, you can use 100% of the 70. Okay, well, what if you're not at 80 degrees? What if you're at, say, uh, 30 degrees? What if the temperature drops from 80 to 30? Drops from 80 down to 30. And then you're at Okay, so now I'm getting 80. 80 what? Not 80 amp hours. I'm getting 80% of the 70. It was rated at 70. Now I got to depreciate it by 20%. It goes down from 100 to 80%. So I'll take 0.8, 80% of 70, and whatever that number is, is what I would put in this equation over here to figure out the new life of that device at that temperature. So can you can you guys see why this is so important to be able to do this? Yeah. Now, I could if I wanted to. I'm not saying I am. Depends on how pissed off I am when I put the exam together. But if I wanted to, I could combine these, couldn't I? I can give you a battery, and I can say, I can give you the amp hour rating of the battery, and I can say, all right, we're going to use the battery at uh, 20, we're going to draw 20 amps. We're going to draw 20 amps from the battery, and we're going to use the battery at 40 degrees. I can do something like that. How would you handle something like that? What would you do first? Uh, first figure out the amp hour capacity. You would. You would first. That's correct. You first figure out the amp hour capacity. So I, I don't know what I just said, but let's just say we're going to pull uh, 20 amps, right? So you first do this one, amp hour capacity. So we come over here at 20 amps. Comes up here, looks like it's about, I don't know, I'm going to guess 59. Okay, so now we're dealing with 59, and then we said we were at 40 degrees. So I got to say at 59, I come up, and I, I'm, I'm going to use about, just kind of guesstimate about, what, 83%? So it's going to be 80, 83% of the 59. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so guys, if it doesn't, you may have to think about that for a while, but uh, this is pretty good stuff. So uh, this is all up on Blackboard. I will read you know, the example here, read that, study the other sheet I showed you. But let me show you the actual battery assignment that you'll do as a quiz. Again, this is up on Blackboard, and I will say uh, not this Tuesday. You're coming tomorrow. You'll be handing this some stuff tomorrow. But definitely by next Tuesday, you should have this, this, this assignment done. So read this. You're going to uh, do some research on the Internet. And this CCA called Cranky Amps, you'll look that up. Now, when you look it up, guys, when I say research, here's what I don't mean. I don't mean go type in cold Cranky, cranky Amps to Google, go to a website, read the website, and then write down what the website says. And that's not what I mean by research. Einstein said that if you can't explain it to a child, you don't know what you're talking about. So what I want you to do is act like I don't know anything. And you got to explain to me what is what the heck is called cranking them. Act like you got to explain it to your little brother, your little kid. Put it in your own words and break it down. Then I'll know you understand it. And then the rest of these are just uh, problems. And we're going to use a Delco DC-12 then we can use the 70 amp hours, and we can use the two graphs that I just showed you. We'll use that Delco DC-12 for this sheet. So read it, um, you know, work it out. If you have any questions over it, you can ask me about it later. If something's not clear, you can ask me about it. But this will count as a quiz grade, one of those extra quiz grades I'm going to give you. Okay? And that really is 
all I have. Anybody have any questions over anything I talked about or questions in general? Okay, don't forget the lab tomorrow. I believe if you're in SAC, you look at your schedule. I'm pretty sure if you're at 001, it's 8 until 10. If you're at 002, it's uh, 10 to, to noon. But look at your schedule to verify it. Make sure you bring a mask, digital multimeter, and whatever I, those assignments you were going to turn in, I, one of my announcements, I, I, I told you to bring the assignment. Whatever you have done in these grading, bring it in so I can get more grades in, in the grade report. Okay? And anything else, we, we'll work it out. And we really need to get an examiner here, guys. It's getting deeper into the semester. And you really are ready, I think, uh, for exam one. So we got to have a lab. So I'm definitely not going to do it this week. We got to have a lab. But probably we need to have an exam next week when you come in, next Tuesday. I'll have more to say about that tomorrow. So, guys, if you don't have any more questions or comments, I will uh, see you tomorrow. Some of you at 8. Some of you at 10, but I will see you tomorrow. And do not forget to bring a mask. Have a great rest of the day. What's what's the uh, class or what classroom is it? Uh, the room number is 330ATLC. We'll meet at that class, but we actually have two rooms. So if you're here early, you'll be in here with me. If you come late, you're going to the overflow room. And there's nothing wrong with being over there, but I'll be on camera in that room. So you really can't ask any questions. All righty. I'll be there early. All right. See you guys later. Good class today. Stay safe. I'll see you tomorrow. Good to meet you face to face for the first time. Yeah, see you tomorrow. See you. Have a good one. Thank you.